Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to try to learn about barrel reflex activation. This is something that is relatively new to vascular surgeons and heart failure. That's a disclosure. Now I would like to be able in the next 10 minutes teach you what this is, how you do it, and why as vascular surgeons we should embrace this technology to assist our heart failure team. This is probably my favorite slide of the whole presentation and I use it quite often when I'm presenting to referring physicians and sometimes when I'm talking to patients. When you talk about the clinical course of heart failure, we know that as heart failure progresses, the quality of life will decrease. Somewhere before you can initiate GDMT, these patients had a lifestyle that structurally changed how they behaved and how their heart is gonna perform. So you get the patients and you start medical therapy, which we have multiple guidelines and we do what's best for the patient, but we have to understand that the biggest challenge is compliance. And it's not only the problem with compliance, now you have a medication that only affects one thing. It also cannot adapt. If you give a medication to bring the pressure down, it's gonna bring the pressure down whether the patient needs it or not. All the way at the other end is where you have advanced interventions. And that is one that you take away the compliance issues, but now you made a big commitment now you have an LVAD or a transplant. Somewhere in the middle for class two and three patients is where we can really affect their outcome, their morbidity, and their mortality. And this is where device therapy is going to work. My understanding of device therapy is that most of it right now will be something that affects only the heart. ICD is gonna affect mortality, CRT is gonna affect morbidity, but they only work on the heart. And when you think about heart failure, it's not just the heart. It's called heart failure, but it's a whole cardiovascular axis. Now we have a device that we can use on that same place, but affect the whole cardiovascular axis. So patients with heart failure have a significant autonomic imbalance with increased sympathetic tone, decreased parasympathetic tone, and obviously heart failure symptoms. The question is why that happens. And it happens because the baroreceptor is not stimulating adequately the brain. The way I present this to physicians and also to patients is talking about air conditioners. If the thermostat is broken, it doesn't matter what the rest of your air conditioner is doing, it's not gonna work. Now what's the question? If we stimulate it electrically, can we rebalance the autonomic system? And more importantly, can we actually normalize the cardiovascular physiology in these patients? So for that, we did a study. And it was a one-to-one -one random, randomized study in which we stabilized the patient's medications before enrolling, and then they were enrolled randomly into either medical management or unchanged medical management and barostimulation. That led to our approval in 2019. And since then, we've been obtaining market data, which will be released talking about CV mortality as well as the heart failure morbidity. We know from the paradigm study that decreasing nt pmp for at least 10% will lead to a significant reduction in morbidity and mortality. We obtained, with barrel stimulation, 25% reduction of the nt bro pmp So if we're gonna play in the same sandbox as other devices, we need to see how we compare with them. And when we look at it, our patients actually were able to walk much further than the second best. Their quality of life improvement was more significant, as was their heart failure classification improvement, with 13% of them actually improving two or more levels of heart failure. So that actually proves that Barostim itself will improve heart failure symptoms by increasing the parasympathetic tone, decreasing the sympathetic tone, and hence decreasing heart failure. So that was the what it is. Now let's talk quickly about how we implant the procedure. 
For most vascular surgeons, this will be an easy procedure. It's minimally invasive, takes roughly about an hour. It's a great case to book as a first case because you can go back with your second case without having to wait for the patient to wake up or obtain hemostasis. We have a generator and a lead. It gets tunneled and then it gets managed by a device management device, which is radio frequency. Those are the two structures that we use. The implantable IPD, which goes in the chest and is about the size of an ICD, and the sinus lead. Before the patient gets scheduled, they see any vascular surgeon in the office, and we do an ultrasound to show that there's less than 50% stenosis. During the procedure, we actually use ultrasound to identify the carotid bifurcation, and then we mark the incision in the neck, and we mark the pocket. The reason for this shape of the pocket is that we need to implant the IPG, but we also need to put the excess lead medially, but lateral to where a mid-sternotomy would be done. We make the incision, which is two to three centimeters. The closer you are to the bifurcation, the easier your exposure is gonna be. Less traction, less nerve injury. Often we ligate the transverse facial vein, and we only expose the anterior wall of the bifurcation and the common carotid artery. Then we have to map, and during the trial, we started with A, and then did a systematic mapping, and whichever your system is, just try to always do it the same way, and that way you can obtain better results. I used to go A, B, C, D, E, but you can go in any way you want. Ultimately, if you get a good response in A, you do not need to map the rest of the carotid. So it's something that you can just implant right there. And that would be the default position if you do not get a blood pressure or heart rate response. The tunneling is simple. We tunnel behind the sternal keratomyostomy muscle, and we try to go out through the bifurcation of the two heads, which when we make the pocket, you can actually see that bifurcation of the heads and go in between them. This is the actual electrode with the disc around it. This is two millimeters, this is about five, six millimeters, and we suture around it, five to six sutures, being careful with your medial sutures when you get close to the nerve of herring so that you don't affect the efferent loops of that nerve. We build a strain relief loop in the neck so that when the patient is moving the neck, it doesn't tug on the lead or the carotid. And ultimately, we close with just two-layer closure, usually three ovicryl and four monocryl, and then dermabon in the skin. So that tells you the how, which, as you see, is very simple. The most important question is the why. And the easy answer would be, why not? As vascular surgeons, why would we walk away from another procedure that we have the best tools to use? I don't need to teach anyone here how to use an ultrasound. I don't need to teach you how to expose the carotid. If you injure something during tunneling, guess what? You're gonna call a vascular surgeon. So you're already there. We actually have the best tools. The second thing about this procedure is that it keeps us valuable in another service line in the hospital. Obviously during the years we've been involved with trauma, we're involved with transplant, general surgery, orthopedics, but now you can be an intrinsic part of your heart failure therapy. If your hospital does not offer LVATs and transplants, now you have one other procedure that you can offer the patient before having to refer to another institution. And from the feasibility of the procedure itself, it's a short procedure that currently is crosswalk to a carotid endarterectomy. So it pays the same as a carotid endarterectomy and is about 21 RVUs for the procedure. And with that, I'll leave you guys with Dr. Clem Darling to present some patient selection and a case. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Clem Darling. I work in Albany, New York. And uh, we became involved with this in the last uh, six months or so, every year. Um, Part of the reason we did this, and I'm, I'm going to speak more on a, on a practice issue than on a technical issue, 
is, uh, you know, we've worked very closely with our cardiologists in many different ways, as well as our cardiac surgeons. And as it was beautifully outlined before, you know, our goal is to continue to work with them and get, and there, because there is a halo effect of taking care of these patients uh, and other patients in the cardiology office. Our, our practice was, is, is unique in the fact that we were, pro we were a university based for 14 years and private practice for 14 years. And recently, over the last five years, came back and sold our practice to the, to the medical center. But during that time, especially the pra private practice time, we actually had offices uh, about 14 offices, uh, two of the which were in cardiology offices to uh, augment their services, and they and we were the natural uh, people to for them to go to when they uh, started uh, doing this procedure. Um, uh, so we've put in about 17 over the last year, which again I, I agree completely with Dr. Perez. They're, they're great for a first case. Sometimes uh, we'll do three on a Friday just to. Uh, to get through the day. We have a very very busy vascular surgery practice, and so we try to minimize the amount of disruption in our regular uh, course, when the hospital's been very uh, helpful in getting us through this and sometimes giving us an extra room to do this to facilitate some of the cardiologic work. Uh, the indications, I think, were, di were discussed before. Uh, many of these patients, when they come in, are a little bit uh, uh, frail, and some of the ones we've placed have uh, systolic blood pressures in the 70s and 80s because of their heart failure. And once the uh, the uh, anesthesiologists get comfortable with that, it's a pretty uh, straightforward procedure, and I agree it takes about 45 minutes uh, to, to an hour to get this done. Uh, much of that is just making sure that uh, the leads have a good um, adaption to uh, uh, and have a, an effect on the carotid sinus so we can uh, make sure this does. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of cases. I work close with Dr. Ali o uh, Mohammed in our uh, cardiology group, which is a private group even uh, that has uh, a, a lot of pet entrance in, the, in our system and uh, really can supply patients uh, for us uh, very uh, well worked up and um, appropriate for this kind of procedure. One of the early cases we did was an 84-year-old gentleman with severe uh, coronary artery disease, status post cabbage, and multiple PCI. Uh, he has an ICD placed. Most of them are placed in the left chest, which is fairly common, so mo almost all the procedures we have done have been on the right chest. Um, his EF, uh, they're usually between 20 and 30, what we see, um, and he had recurrent uh, visits for his congestive heart failure, and so we, we went to uh, re-implant it for him. His systolics, like I said, were in the 70s when we started this. Um, he, he did extremely well, though, and actually he's now active in playing in the pickleball league up in, Al in Albany, uh, and his family is thrilled, and his quality of life is uh, actually uh, much improved with this device. I was skeptical when I first uh, did this, uh, having worked with a lot of the cardiology patients, but he's done an incredible. He's done incredibly with this, uh, much like most of them. We have had knock on wood, and I have not had any significant complications. Uh, the only once uh, when they uh, took sutures out, they exposed the uh, the generator, which you had to re re implant, and that patient actually has done extremely well for this. Um, this is a complicated pathway that they use. We've actually modified this now. Uh, there is a lot of referral base in that cardiology practice that we that relies on us. So in order to facilitate this for them and for the patients, instead of the patients coming to their office and then coming to our office, we're actually establishing an office in their in, in their practice uh, to see these patients so they don't have to travel that much as I live in a relatively rural upstate New York area. Uh, but it also facilitates us being able to be actively involved in their practice and get some of a halo effect from their aortic aneurysms, their carotid uh, endarterectomies, uh, and uh, some of the peripheral interventions. Now, it may seem contraintuitive and contralogical that we would work so closely with cardiologists because they do some peripheral interventions, uh, but actually in doing so, we've increased both volumes in our practice and their practice by working together as opposed to working in competition. Uh, and I, I would recommend that strongly, but again, we have a unique practice uh, where we are the 600-pound gorilla uh, in the institution, uh, and so people have uh, been very helpful with us. Now, one may ask, why would a vascular surgeon do this, uh, besides the technical aspects of the operation and the reimbursement? But first, obviously, uh, and most importantly, it's better care for the patient and better quality of life for them. Um, and, and as was Dr. Perez had mentioned earlier, we are the ones that can do a carotid exposure. Uh, the exposure, you know, I, I 
like Enrico Asha, I tend to do minimally, minimal incisions for our carotid endarterectomy because we do eversions. Uh, and this is a very similar incision. It heals beautifully and they barely see the, uh, uh, the scar at the end. Again, we have satellite offices where we see patients with the, in the cardiologist's office. Both of us get to bill, and both, uh, it, it, but it saves time and uh, energy for the patient because these patients are fairly ill and they have a lot of doctor's appointments. And if we can minimize the movement for them, uh, they are very, very appreciative. And also, you, once you gain a, a good rapport with the cardiologist, essentially they call you for everything, which some of my partners don't like because we get a lot of. Uh, interesting consults that we uh, may not need, but I, I think the more you talk to them, the more you work with them, the more likely you're going to increase your practice uh, and uh, increase the patient's, um, in, in, increase uh, the uh, patient's care uh, and the long-term outcome of these patients. And it really expanded our, our patient base uh, for getting more and more patients in, I, like I said, for the halo effect of other procedures that we perform. Uh, and we've, and uh, currently I do, we do a lot of um, TAVRs with them, carotid-based TAVRs, uh, and I participate in a lot of the uh, other complex work with the cardiac surgeons, and this has expanded our practice also. And it, you know, the, the group of patients that need this and are going to benefit from this is ever expanding. And as uh, that complex slide I showed you earlier, uh, it's the EP and uh, some of the, and the heart failure groups that come to us. We do not have a heart transplant system anymore and, uh, and don't uh, implant uh, uh, that LVADs yet. But uh, it is a good therapy to, to before the patient goes to a destination place to get those if they need them. But most of these patients actually have improved physi physiologically, and uh, none of the patients we've, we've operated on have needed a heart transplant uh, or been transferred out of our network. So uh, I think we're more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, but those are the, the reasons I think we've become active, uh, actively involved with this, because I think it's great for the patients. Uh, it's great for uh, increasing our practice and working with a cardiologist and trying to minimize the amount of turf battles that there are uh, within the system, which I know increases uh, the uh, benefit for the patient, uh, not only for quality of life, but also uh, for uh, longitudinal uh, follow-up for these patients. So thank you very much. really interesting and exciting. Um, do you have any interest from the cardiac surgeons with doing this or any competition from cardiac surgeons? So during the years I proctored multiple cardiac surgeons during the trial. Right now in our region I don't see any cardiac surgeons doing it. Once again anyone who has surgical skills can be taught. I don't need to teach a vascular surgeon how to do this. You just tell them what the procedure is like and they do it because it's, it's their wheelhouse. Yeah, the, um, similarly, in our place, one of the thoracic surgeons was interested in it. The, when we discussed with a hospital that it would probably lengthen the time in the OR because, again, they have to learn a new procedure that we do every day. So uh, the hospital actually, I wouldn't say mandated, but, but it's on our delineation of privileges and not on theirs. Which that is key. We did add it to our actual privileging. So it's something that you may want to do in your institution, and it should be easy to do because you have all the tools for it. Hey, I'm Robbie Rue. I'm one of the vascular fellows at Hopkins. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, diabetics have uh, baroreceptor dysfunction, and um, did that affect the, uh, the efficacy of this product? And then the second question is, did you ever, so were all these patients referred to you or did you ever have any of your own patients, like that's like a very large subset of, of our population, um, did you refer those back to cardiology to see if they would be appropriate candidates for this? So I never had a own patient of mine get treated with a barostin. They all came from cardiologists. As we've grown the practice, now it comes from cardiologists that are outside of the system and we refer them back to them for therapy and management and they quickly understand which patients will benefit the most. From uh, the diabetic standpoint in the trial, I think there was a normal type of diabetic patient that we have in any vascular study and we did not see a significant difference because we're directly stimulating now the afferent fibers of the barrel stimulator. So we're basically hijacking their thermostat. We're, we're owning their thermostat now, we're controlling it. Thanks. 
do most cardiologists know about this procedure or is this something that is kind of still just being investigatory and so it will start to spread but is it something that I would need to introduce to the cardiologist in my area or would they already know about it? Yeah, the way it's, well, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, you know, I, I, like I said, we have a referral base that's a couple of hundred miles in upstate New York. Uh, the, what will happen is the local um, cardiologist, a hundred miles away, will refer them to the cardiologist near us who has the most knowledge about it, and then they refer them to us. At least that's how it works in our system. But it's something that will take education, and uh, the CVRX team can help you with that. They've done a great job in our community. We've been on every one of their trials since 2009, so the group of cardiologists that work within 25, 30 miles knew about it, but they've actually spread it all across the state right now. But you will need their help, or you need to out, go out, give talks, and teach them. Nice technique, uh, but have there been any instances where you have to do maintenance work like battery change or explant the device uh, for infection or something? So like any implantable device, there will be infections. We've done over 110 at Advent Health. We have not had infections, but we know of infections. It can happen. These patients, like Dr. Darling said, they're frail. They're not the best protoplasm. And then battery change is easy, it's three to five years. So that part actually, it's, it's something you can do on the local even. So I, I can confess my failures. We had one patient who uh, was seen by a cardiologist uh, that's about 70 miles away, decided he was going, he was he closed it subcuticularly, but he picked off a scab and, and unfortunately exposed the device. So I'd never really been faced with that problem. So I called up the, uh, a cardiologist and a thoracic surgeon put pacemakers in. I said, what do you do when you have pacemakers? Well, they said, we just wash them off and put them back in, uh, and I, which is what I did, and much to my dismay, but it worked out, and the guy's, and the, the guy's done well. I couldn't, you know, it's an inert metal, so it's theoretically not, and it's a, uh, the tubing is also inert, so theoretically you can get away with it, but that's the only, only issue we've had. Okay. There's an urban legend of a patient that uh, their device actually came out and the wife knitted a little bag to hold the device out. I never saw that patient, but I've heard about it. <laughs> do you do them under cervical block or? Uh, we've done them under both. I, you know, I talked to Dr. Uh, Todd Berland, who does them down at NYU. He does them all under local. Um, it's, you know, you have to block a fairly large area or uh, but I, we do them under general for the most part. I do under total IV anesthesia, general. Right. Um, I particularly don't like the block if we're going to map, because right. if they go deep with the cervical block, they can blunt the response. Okay. But ultimately, as we learn more data, we know that we can position it on the A position, and usually the results will be the same. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Mike Gone from Cambridge, UK. On that mapping point, um, we've previously done a cadaveric study which shows that the carotid sinus can be uh, situated in the external carotid and the common carotid, as well as just the proximal internal carotid. Have you come across any situations like that? So it's a very interesting question, and the, most of the time when we see a carotid, it's a diseased carotid. You've gotten rid of all the planes, you have a big plaque, you're not looking for the baroreceptor. As you're doing more of this implants and looking at carotids, you will see a little like a mound that looks like what a baroreceptor should look like. When I do see that, it could be like you said, anywhere. Now, in theory, the closer you get to the efferent fibers of the nerve of herring, the better the response. And that's why we choose position A preferentially. But if you do see that very descript baroreceptor, then I always test there also. Well, thank you for the thank engaging you. questions and you guys have a good day. Yep.